Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 559. Science Faction, injuring women's brains and the benefits of COVID. I injure women's brains naturally with my actions, mm -hmm. with mansplaining, mm -hmm. with gaslighting them. Yeah. So it's, it's psychological warfare, but it's unintentional. It's something I do just because of dysfunction. I love it when you explain to a woman how her period is, quote unquote, supposed to work. Uh, it's, it's a heavy flow. Uh, let me explain to you what heavy flow is, because uh, just from the blank expression on your face, you... I have stopped listening, so I just got to go into it. Listen, ma'am, I can tell that you have not practiced what we call holding it in. <laughs> uh, did you know that you can also, why do you not soaking these in vodka before you insert them? This is a two for one. I, it's an extra step for me. It's something you get to do naturally. Uh, and speaking of somebody who gets to do things naturally, I, of course, am your host, comedian archaeologist Robert Timothy. With me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? I am doing great. I know I will never understand the frat guys who soak maxi pads in vodka and put that in their underwear. I think it's like, just the, the point? yeah, it's just the tampon. That the maxi pads in vodka in your underwear is like the <laughs> oduls of getting trying to get drunk through your colon. Like, yeah, you're not gonna get wasted, but it'll smell like you tried. Yeah, so it like what a BYU frat yeah. dude. Or like that fifth year senior who had a real bad drinking problem and had to stay behind because he uh, he failed too many classes and then, you know, his parents gave him an ultimatum. We'll pay for another year of college, but you can't be drinking. He he does the maxi pad thing just so he could feel like he's part of the game. So if anybody sniffs his underwear, they'll think this dude's been drinking. <laughs> Uh, I also like the idea of instead of Mormons using alcohol in the maxi pad that they're not getting drunk off of, they're like using olive oil because it still feels sinful to them, but isn't actually sinful. Or, I mean, you could pick coffee. Like they, for some reason, can't have coffee. <laughs> you're, you're dancing with the devil, Bobby. You are dancing with the devil. So weird side note, there's a plant that grows in the east part of San Diego. It also grows in very uh, wide swath of the, the American Southwest. And it's called ephedra, and it has within it ephedrin. You might remember that it was, it was used as a diet supplement. Fenfen. Yeah, fenfen. Which was like, like, hey, if a baby named this drug, what would you call for the public? Because that's how fucking stupid we think they are. Fenfen? <laughs> yeah. Good. And ephedrin can also, through some synthesis, be part of the process for creating methamphetamine and stuff like that. And it's a stimulant, right? And the natives used it. They would chew on it as kind of like the way we would use coffee. And so when me and the crew are out doing work out there, we will chew on it because it's a great pick me up. You're walking around, you start chewing on one of these sticks. It's like you had a cup of coffee, especially good at like 3 p.m. when you still have four hours left on a work day or something and you've been out since 10 a.m. It's nice to have something like that around and you can just, you know, chew on it and, and get a little bit more energy. Which when your workers start chopping it up into lines. Yes. That Bobby has a problem. <laughs> Because they don't share. <laughs> well, maybe you're not cool, Bobby. You yeah. ever think of that? They share with everybody else on the crew. The other name for this plant is Mormon tea because the Mormons <laughs> do like pulverize it and make it into a tea. And I am still baffled by the idea that they're like, caffeine, no way. That's the devil's path to hard drugs. But ephedrine, hell yes. Let's name it after ourselves. They also have a similar view towards Catholics and their own church. Like, like, listen, I get it. You want to shit on Catholicism, shit on Catholicism. But let's let's look inward as well, Mormons. Yeah, I, I would. I mean, it just be like, look, if caffeine is like too hard a drug for you, that's like the guy going like, no, sorry, I don't do weed. That might ruin my life. I just snort lines of meth all the time. That's my thing. Dude, can you imagine all the other shit Joseph Smith could have gotten away with saying? Like, caffeine's bad, but this meth plant, <laughs> that is the pathway to salvation, my fellow Utahians. Also, I'm going to have to bang, like, all of your wives. Well, not, not yours, Jenkins. Please tell her to stop knocking at my door at night. All right, let's move right on to science articles. From molecules to particles. This is Science Articles. Well, are you saying my wife's not good enough for you? That is exactly what I am saying, Jenkins. 
Well, you know what? I must say this in terms of like the discrimination factor. When you look at those LDS members who have like 40 or 50 wives, there's a good handful of them that are like in their 60s or 70s that they didn't marry until they were in their 60s or 70s because they like kicked some other dude out and stole all his wives. So like, I guess what you I- are a power move, wife Gertrude. <laughs> You are not here to pleasure my loins as the others are. I I've, I've made the I've made a similar joke before, but it's like when you look at some of those like old like those crazy LDS members, the ones who who do do the multiple wives thing, it's like I've got 15 wives, but in adding so many, I've brought the average down to like two and a half. Like I might have been able to average like a 5 or what we might call a prairie 7. But, like, by adding all these old ladies, uh, yeah, I've technically upped my overall numbers, but I've lowered my average dramatically. Dramatically. It'd be like if you were a quarterback and you're like, yeah, I start every game, but I only complete, like, 10% of my throws. I've got wives and fillies in different municipalities (laughs) within Utah. (laughs) Oh, dear. Uh, Bring these hoes back from the temple for some Mormon tea. (laughs) (laughs) Mormonism is pretty down, if you ask me. Article number one, women be acting like zombies on the soccer field. Hmm, haven't heard this one yet. Uh, This is a Chris Rock. Sounds like a dated bit, Bobby. (laughs) Oh, Sinbad, thank you very much. Women be acting like zombies on the soccer field. (laughs) So this is actually a super interesting article in Nature this week that looks at head trauma in female soccer players in U.S. high schools. Specifically, it compares it to their male counterparts. Now, I should start off by saying this is not one of those tiny little studies we talk about sometimes. We're like, interesting study. They looked at 14 people. This is an N number of 80,000. Fairly evenly split, about 40-40, give or take, you know, 1,000, 40-40 boys and and girls. So they looked at 80,000 high school soccer players, and they found that female soccer players are twice as likely, twice as likely, technically 1.88 times, to suffer concussions than their male counterparts while playing soccer. That's kind of crazy because we have the this version of A, soccer as a very non-contact sport, one where you wouldn't get concussions, but B, as a sport where if there is going to be violence, it's going to happen more on the male side than the female side. So really, really interesting study. There's been some suspicions before that head injuries were more common and required longer to heal in young women than in young men, but this study seems to be the first real solid data, at least big N number data, to point to some hard evidence of that. Now, um, we had a friend in town. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Not we had a friend in town, and you and I met up recently. And uh, well, before you got there, Bobby. Uh huh. We had talked about this, about how like high school uh, soccer athletes, female soccer athletes, have like 60% more concussions because of... Almost twice um, as many more concussions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because because of... Uh, uh, I, I believe we, we talked about it before. Uh, it was because their upper body uh, doesn't have the musculature to support and absorb the shock from head, head impacts. That's one theory. One theory is that there's smaller skulls, smaller musculature, smaller weight to like if you're hitting heading a ball, it's the same ball. So smaller weight to ball ratio. And I think maybe the boys have gotten more concussions from, you know, just roughhousing the way boys do. So sure. maybe like maybe we're seeing these girls, you know, in the uh, in their concussion puberty as they're flowering, as their brains are developing this lovely CTE, whereas the boys have, uh, you know, that's the one area where boys get a head start in girls yes. developmentally is CTE. They're getting concussed at a 10th grade level, even though he's only in the seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> really because my son's going to BYU uh, he can't drink but he does have uncontrollable rage from, caused by CTE so um, good luck on your academic scholarship Susie they also noticed some differences between what caused the the concussions in males it was more often a collision with another player that caused a concussion whereas with females slipping or slipping on vodka soaked maxi <laughs> that was the, in the second locker room. biggest part yes whereas with <laughs> females it was either heading the ball or hitting a goal post so like basically hitting Ugh. like not the other players so that was interesting because that also means that that if you think about that, that means that for every collision that the boys have, there should 
theoretically be two injured parties. Either or both of them could have gotten a concussion, whereas in the female injuries, only one of them have. So we're actually seeing an even bigger difference than maybe the numbers point out with that that 1.88 times difference. Boys were also more likely to be removed from play right after a suspected head injury than were girls. But that's also because a lot of these head injuries, again, for the girls were happening when they were hitting uh, a heading a ball or hitting a, a goalpost or something like that. So they weren't as easily recognizable as when you know two people crash at full speed. Uh, I have another thing I'd like to add to this. Uh-huh. Uh, another big difference is that if you've watched female soccer, if you watch ladies soccer, uh-huh. it is like those ladies are intense. Yes. They're super tough. When you watch male soccer, those dudes flop. Those dudes are intentionally trying to draw like those dudes. You know, I know you tried to make a, j- a, j- a joke, Damien, but I actually I was thinking about this when I was thinking about confounding factors. So like what are the confounding factors that might be at play here other than just physiology? So maybe it's not just you know, the thickness of the skull and the size of the musculature of the neck and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe there's other stuff at play. And if you think about it, you know, these are U.S. schools that they did these in. Well, if you're a girl, if you're a young woman in a United in a U.S. high school and you want to play a competitive game, soccer is pretty competitive. Like if, you're, if you want to play a physical competitive game, there's like basketball and soccer. And that that's where the, the girls who have a lot of physical, you know, maybe some rage and some desire to play a physical sport. That's where they go. And in American high schools, guys who want to do that go and play football. So, so think about that. We kind of have a filter for our aggressive young men to go into football. And so the guys who then select to go play soccer, and this isn't always the case, and these are just stereotypes, but usually the guys who are going to play soccer are not the most aggressive guys who are in that class or that grade, whereas the girls who go to play soccer often are. You know, maybe they'll pick field hockey or something else, but soccer is going to be up there with the aggressive sports that a young girl can play. So possibly... We could also not just be seeing a physiological difference, but a cultural difference in where children with inherent aggressive physical tendencies tend to end up vis-a-vis male versus female in U.S. high schools. So what we need to do is develop more uh, a variety of women's sports, expand Title IX into high school Mm -hmm. and get some real great uh, lady MMA programs. Yeah, let's let's start making soccer safer by turning these hyper aggressive girls in high school into living weapons. Or they we could start like female American football leagues. They could do that too, or like rugby, women's rugby. Ooh, see there we go. Yeah, I, I mean I've been to Australia. Do we really want to turn our high schools into Australia? I've never been to Australia. You've never been I'm to sorry. Australia, and also yeah, I feel like we would have a hundred percent less shootings every year. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a lot more koala sexual assault and i'm not saying that's yeah, a negative be... or a positive it's just going to happen oh there's a lot more pouch play all right on to article number two <laughs> hold on bobby i'm googling pouch play right now <laughs> no don't do that <laughs> I'll just i'll be i'll be listening but muted for the next 15 minutes just go <laughs> article number two covid wasn't all bad it wasn't all bad. Uh, like, for example, no, I mean, no joke. I got to work on me. I mean, I, all jokes aside. Sure. You know, before COVID, I was working three jobs, getting my master's and fucking dungeon mastering the awful neutral podcast. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I really felt like I was burning the candle on at both ends. And I think that the year of COVID, you know, just just I got a new job, stayed home a lot. And I stopped playing that stupid game. Uh, no, our podcast is doing very well over COVID, Bobby. You should give us a listen. Uh, Awful Neutral. If you like Dungeons and Dragons, we just recently had Alex Jones playing the devil. That sounds fun for everybody. Awful Neutral. But really, I mean, all jokes aside, I think I kind of worked on me this last year. I think I came out a little bit better person. Sure. I'd like to think, despite all that, I fight to keep the horniness level high on this on two podcasts. Yes. You got to always keep the horny high, especially if you're going to do some pouch play. But in this case, <laughs> it's hard it is to work on yourself, but not fix any of the red flags in the sexual department that need addressing to save your marriage. Uh, so in this particular case, a very interesting article came out. It builds on some of the stuff we've talked about both on this main show and on our COVID episodes. And it's super, super interesting and something that I think needs to be talked about, which is that even though COVID has had a devastating effect on the world, it hasn't all been bad. 
there have been a couple of good things. We're going to get to the main good thing, the thing that this article is about. But we know that we have ex accelerated mRNA vaccine research more than a decade. We've shown the vulnerability to more a more dangerous pandemic that's undoubtedly coming down the road and how we can prepare for it. We've helped accelerate things like work from home, which I think is going to drastically change our society and certain social safety net policies, which even far right leaning people had to accept were necessary in certain cases. Do they, though? Do they well, have they to took the, they, didn't, because... they took the checks. They took the checks. <laughs> okay, We've that's... increased funding and research in certain scientific spheres, likely permanently. And it also taught us which horrible people we've been Facebook friends with that we sh that should now be completely cut out of our lives. It has done some good things. But this next thing is probably the best. That is the effect it has had on the seasonal flu. So we've talked about this a bunch on the COVID only podcast, a little bit on this podcast as well. Flu numbers plummeted, plummeted in 2020 and continue through 2021. Remember, we have interesting data on this because like, like the flu would show up to senior nursing homes yeah. like, all right, we're here to clean out your old people. Uh, you know, we did to do a yearly sweep. And Basically, like, oh, I'm sorry. the COVID guy already came through here. Well, it's crazy because, you know, we have an interesting thing that happens, which is that respiratory viruses in general tend to go through the winter because it's cold and there's less humidity. We not only get to see what happens during our flu season, but we can see what happens in South America in our summer, which is their winter and their flu season. And we started seeing last summer in 2020 that the flu was essentially not hitting. Like in places like Australia, South Africa, parts of uh, South America, we're like, where the fuck is the flu? This is crazy. And it turns out what's going on is you can pretty much piece this together. You know, the flu is A, less contagious than COVID, and B, is not really asymptomatically transferred. And so when we all started social distancing and quarantining and wearing masks and staying home when we were sick, that basically stopped. Using toilet paper, washing <laughs> your hands after not using toilet paper. Yeah. Washing your hands after going to the bathroom instead of just before for your own pleasure. <laughs> instead of just going back to bed and wiping your hands on your sheets. <laughs> When we did that, the flu just basically went away. It plummeted. It showed just how easy it is in a way to get rid of the flu. Because again, flu is less contagious. It doesn't transfer asymptomatically. And anybody who had half a cough or a sniffle during COVID, like if they I, they were persona non grata in public, if you were out there coughing, if you walked by me and sniffled a little bit, I would do the this is Sparta kick to your midsection. Like there, there is people were just not coming out when they were sick. And so the flu didn't get transferred. And we saw deaths plummet, plummet from the flu. Here are some numbers that will make your fucking head spin when you think about this. So the year before COVID, U.S. flu deaths were 22,000. That was actually a pretty you mean the before time. Yes, that was actually a pretty good year because the year before that they were thirty four thousand, and a few years before that, on a very bad flu season, we might lose fifty to seventy thousand people a year. That's a lot. That's twice as many as car accidents on a bad year. That's a lot of people who died from the flu. Actually, if you guys will remember, if you listen to our show pre COVID. The getting the flu vaccine was actually one of my soapboxes that I would stand on and yell about because it was such an easy way to save so many lives. Damien, how many people have died due to the flu during COVID? A very good year was the year before. That was 22,000. The year before that was 34,000. A few years before that was 50,000. What do you think we had last year? Uh, I'm going to say uh, we're going to be actually be in the positive. We're going to say negative six. We're going to say that the flu not only didn't kill people, it saved but lives. Just, just yeah, but just as uh, just as driving drunk can occasionally save right. lives, as opposed this to stop end people it, from getting just, COVID. Yeah, like a bit, like a, uh, we're going to say that the the flu only took killed like one guy who was going to do a terrorist attack or something, and so hence. <laughs> Well, way to step on the big reveal here, Damien. But it was 600. It. <laughs> 600 people. Can you, that was, that's like our graduating high school class, Damien. That is how many people in this country died oh, during the entire COVID flu season, despite the fact that it was literally tens of thousands every single year before that. That is a crazy reduction in deaths. And it's mimicked in other places we have data for, including Australia, South Africa. This is crazy. I wonder if we were to chart those 600, if they would correlate to like the 600 people from our graduating high school, like we're a certain percentage of the people like fucking conspiracy theorists that died. We're a certain percentage of them. I it uh, Probably. 
Probably. There may be entire strains of the flu that go permanently extinct this last you know, year, 18 months. In an ideal world, this may even represent an overall benefit like COVID might. If we think about it, if we take the 600,000 or so dead in the U.S. and then retain that triple digit death count, I'm not saying we will, but if we're able to for the next few decades, wow, we might have actually lowered overall death rates during COVID if it turns out that we can lower overall flu deaths on an annual basis regularly. This is huge news. It's a huge success. And we should look at this as a huge success for social distancing. And by the way, it should also tell you just how bad COVID is, because when we look at like those extra deaths, due to COVID, like, oh, hey, we have this many extra deaths this year. That doesn't account for the tens of thousands that didn't die from the flu. It's like hey, there's a tens of thousands of buffer in there, extra people that COVID killed. I mean, you said it comes out as a positive, like, yay, the flu's gone. But now we have this virus that kills so many more people as part of our yearly routine. Well, maybe or maybe the vaccines are fairly effective and it doesn't become a seasonal issue. And then this goes away, you know, and and maybe some of the stuff like we've been talking about, like a universal influenza vaccine becomes a reality because of our ability to make mRNA vaccines that got progressed because of COVID. And so maybe we find a way to actually make flu extinct. Maybe the flu for like our children's generation will be like typhoid was for like our grandparents. We're like, oh man, typhoid's back around. It's killing everybody. And you're like, what? That is such an old timey disease that I can't even imagine it without thinking of somebody in a Stetson hat in black and white. And then the next generation, all they'll have to cure is the common cold. You see, that's the problem with liberals in America. We're becoming too weak. I want our, I want we have, I want my children to have to fight off the black death. That's how you create strong kids. Now, there might be some downsides to this. There are some concerns that the next flu season may be much worse than some previous ones because we've had less exposure. So there's going to be more people who have a little to no immunity to it. It's especially worrisome to young children like toddlers who might have never had exposure until they're like now five or six. And then in case it could be much, much worse. So again, if you especially if you have a young child, make sure they get their flu shot because that's going to be extra important this coming flu season to make sure that they don't get an even worse case of the flu because we essentially haven't had our we haven't had our flu rocky training we haven't been dragging that flu log through the snow as as somebody comes behind us as adrian <laughs> is behind us yelling that we're being a bum we haven't done that this year and so you need the extra training make sure your little kids get their flu shots this year oh god why am i this is a respiratory disease it's so cold it's ready <laughs> adrian call 911 my asthma <laughs> uh i love this story it's one one of those few things I get to do that's like a great thing about COVID. Damien, I thought we should end this episode by thinking of like if all of the great things that came about because of COVID, like the benefits, I listed some of them before, if they were pleading their case into a courtroom as to why COVID wasn't all that bad. Okay, so for instance, you know, like uh, working from home would say, excuse me, working from home, your honor, I'd like to make my case. Yes, we've had uh, near 150 years after the industrial revolution and we're still sending people to offices for nine to five work that they could really do most of in about four and a half hours in general, but we keep them away from their family and we make them commute for hours on end and waste uh, greenhouse gases, you know, running their cars and then travel back and forth and get up hours early. Whereas now we figured out we can basically just roll out of bed, hop on a computer and get most of that work done while still getting to spend quality time with our family and not having to leave the house. COVID isn't all that bad, Your Honor. Thank you. Yes, but please, somebody think of your employer. Your employer... The, Who gets to save? Him... He gets to save on office goods. Yes, like, right. He, he, he office. enjoys paying rent. He has a Brewster's Million situation. He has to, <laughs> they, it's already been expensed, Bobby. I was thinking a big one, like a, like a, a bunch of dudes, like they're like a congregation of dudes in like trench coats. Mm -hmm. They look disheveled. They look uh, like your stereotypical pervert. Yeah. You know, like, uh, uh, we, 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 uh, this has been huge. Uh, Only fans has really blown up. I mean, before there was a girl in your life, you just had to picture her naked all the time. And now you could just pay to see what a comedian or your buddy's wife looks like naked. And uh, they get to know that too. So, uh, I mean, before, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, so, I mean, they're, they're all immediately kicked out for getting erections through their trench coat. Get them the hell out of here. Your Honor, Your Honor, uh, that's uh, Creepy Guys group number one. Creepy Guys group number two would like to stand up. We also have a case to be made. Your Honor. No, they have erections too. Sit it back. You, you speak sitting. You're, okay, yes. that's fine. You're, we, will, we will remain sitting, Your Honor. That's actually my fetish anyway, that and pouch work. <laughs> But, uh, Your Honor, I would like to bring up that up until recently, it was considered uncouth for a grown male like myself to wander around a children's park wearing a full facial mask. 
I would like to say that COVID has now made that socially acceptable uh, and mix that with sunglasses. Nobody can tell where my eyes are going. Now I can do what I want to do. I'm not creeping anybody out. Everybody wins. COVID's not all bad, Your Honor. Uh, another group of guys, they look shady as well, but they're more, they look more like uh, an Ocean's Eleven crew or like Robert De Niro's crew from Heat. Uh, yeah, we're just general, uh, you know, contractors for crimes. You know, yeah, you need something busted into or anything. And let me just say, in a society where everybody's wearing masks, it's our success rate for heist has gone up literally 4,000%. It's so easy to get lost in a crowd now. You just put on a mask, everybody's wearing a mask. And cops are less hesitant to shoot people nowadays. Also, it's way easier to get COVID in a crowd now. <laughs> COVID bomb. <laughs> just run. A delegation from the dog community sent a letter. Uh, they're just oh, yeah. happy about all the attention. This has been great. <laughs> that would be that would be one that definitely made it. Uh, also, one we talked about the other week that was kind of a surprise. Everybody thought it'd go the other way. It'd be like, excuse me, uh, Your Honor. We are the people who may or may not commit suicide, and we would like to point out that suicides were dramatically down during COVID, uh, despite all premonitions that it would go the other way. And so, therefore, there's some mental health aspects that we think are going to be seriously well done. Also, by the way, telemedicine taking huge leaps and bounds. Now I can see a therapist wherever I want, and, uh, even if I'm in, like, bumfuck nowhere. I can see a specialist who, who can help me with my problems, and I can do it on my phone, and it, it's very, very affordable. All of that works. Your Honor, COVID, not that bad. Um, we're, uh, I'm also seeing a time portal opening up in the back of the courtroom. Uh, we're going to go ahead and address the time traveler who just stepped through. Um, yes, I am from 60 years into the future. Through our multiverse technology, we discovered that through COVID and because of COVID, many couples were forced to live together for a year without the distraction of job and family. This event allowed many couples to realize they were simply not meant for each other, and they did they prevented the birth of millions of dysfunctional children and prevented seven trillion dollars in future crime. Thank you, COVID. I like how sixty years in the future somebody is speaking with a oddly like nineteen thirties radio accent. I was speaking perfect Esperanto, Bobby. <laughs> Esperanto is the future. Uh, I bet you actually Esperanto took a huge bump. I bet you a lot more people learned Esperanto. There was just more free time. Like, it's just, it's one of those things. <laughs> yeah, the Babel Esperanto program, one of the biggest sellers. Uh, thank you, audience, for coming back for Science Faction 559, where you learned all about how women are actually getting more concussions while playing soccer and how COVID might have killed the flu. Thank you so much for joining us and come on back next week for Science Faction 560. My favorite type of pouch play is when the stepmother gets stuck in the pouch. You've been listening to Science Fiction. Wait, that's not right. <laughs>